wishing you happy Independence Day and welcome to Sagamore Hill! Bully! Bully! How delighted I am to see the regiment, the Rough Riders! <laughs> Bully boys! Uh, what you heard, ladies and gentlemen, was what no, it was known as the regimental song. It'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. And it will be in Oyster Bay and throughout the country as we celebrate independence and the great gifts given by our creator of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If there's anything that you take away from my remarks today, anything at all, perchance, in the way of entertainment or inspiration, I dedicate our time together today to the men and women of the United States Armed Forces and to our veterans. Hear, 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 hear. Well, now we've heard the band play. We had the wonderful Star Spangled Banner. But let us continue in the tradition of being a country that shows its love and devotion through song. Would you all who are able stand and rise? Gentlemen, take off your hats. Let's join together in the great hymn, God Bless America. You know the words that are on your heart. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, her white with foam. <laughs> God bless America, my home sweet. Home, God bless America, my home, sweet home. Bully, bully, have a seat, have a seat if you may. Welcome to Sagamore Hill and indeed to Oyster Bay and to Glen Cove and Cove Neck. It was here that many of the children were born, here that the Young children went to Cove Neck School, and here that we worship as a family at Christ Church, Oyster Bay. To get to know Oyster Bay and the people of this area is to get to know part of what was the substance and continues to be for the Roosevelt family and the legacy of the Roosevelt administration. I'm delighted that you're here and that we remember all of those who have sacrificed and given to us that we might live free. I also must thank you for recognizing me here today. Uh, I was greeted so warmly and appropriately by so many of you. You said, good morning, Teddy, or hello, Mr. President. My friends know that in my retirement, I prefer to be called by my old military title, Colonel. For my brief time in the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, history remembers us as the Rough Riders, so ably kept alive Give a round of applause for the Rough Riders here today. Bully! There's nothing so good for the inside of a man or a woman as the outside of a horse. And, well, David McCullough wrote the book Mornings on Horseback in part to describe what the Roosevelt family enjoyed here at Sagamore Hill and nearby in my own childhood at Tranquility in Oyster Bay. Well, all of those greetings I mentioned, they all stand in such stark contrast to the one young man that saw me sprinting through the parking lot I had on my top hat. He pointed at me and told his friends, he said, look, there's the Monopoly dude. <laughs> Quite humbling for an old politician, I assure you. And if he would have known his history as well as Ms. Shaw, he would have known I was the anti-Monopoly dude. The great trust buster. Oh, we do have some progressives in the audience. Well done. All right, young lady, hold that hat, would you? There you are. Well, I'm delighted that we're here to celebrate July 4th. It's not just a date on the calendar. It's a date in 1776 when our founding fathers, they did indeed give a pledge that they would sacrifice 
their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. They pledged that to this country, and many of them sacrificed it. Uh, uh, in July 4th, 1863, we did not know whether or not the great experiment of a democracy would long survive. But the victories at Vicksburg and Gettysburg gave hope to that my favorite president, Abraham Lincoln, a man whose cause was served by my own father, Theodore Roosevelt, as a commissioner, an allotment commissioner and a sanitary commissioner during that terrible war. That terrible war in which my mother's family, the Bullocks, played a major role for the Confederacy. So as was mentioned by Assemblyman Levine, we are in a time when America is divided. But we've been divided in worse ways before. Let us be inspired by all who have come before us to unite. Because we are one nation of one people, united by one flag and called upon to leave our country in better condition than we found it, and not in worse, for these future generations, our children, our grandchildren, Americans not yet born in the womb of time. On this July 4th, I remember the children who grew up here and played at Sagamore Hill, children not unlike the children that I see here. Of course, there was my daughter Alice, who was 17 when we entered the White House. Uh, you might know that at the White House her behavior was scandalous. <laughs> Alice smoked cigarettes in public. She flirted with Army and Navy officers. And when the White House punch was discovered spiked, we knew who the culprit was. <laughs> Alice kept a snake in her purse and introduced the snake as Emily Spinach at diplomatic dinners and receptions. Uh, Alice was famously married at the White House in 1906 to Congressman Nicholas Longworth of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, the band may be familiar with the wonderful wedding waltz, Alice's Blue Gown. Uh, Alice outlived all of her younger siblings uh, to the age of 96, well into the administration of President James Earl Carter. And I do believe Alice's uh, 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 personality delightfully summed up in a needlepoint message that was on a pillow on her settee. The message on the pillow said, if you don't have anything nice to say about someone, come sit next to me. <laughs> Ted Jr. was the first of the children to be born in this home. Ted Jr. who would of course go to fight in World War I and would return in World War II. Ted Jr. in World War II, the only general officer to go to shore on D-Day at Utah Beach, leading troops there with nothing more than his cane, famously stating when they realized they were about 2,000 yards off the mark that, gentlemen, the war starts here. It was a month later in the fields of France that Ted Jr. spent the evening in conversation with his nephew Quentin, named for his late brother, memorialized here at the foot of the flag. The following morning, Ted Jr. was dead of a heart attack after the war, Ted Jr., having been awarded the Medal of Honor, he was buried at Normandy. And Quentin's remains, the only boy to be buried, a uh, uh, World War I casualty be buried in our World War II cemeteries. Quentin lies by his side today at Normandy. Uh, of course, my daughter Ethel, she would go on to live a life of service, uh, famously being a national officer of the American Red Cross. Uh, the younger boys, Archie and Quentin, known here for climbing the trees and entertaining all of the staff and the gardeners. Uh, those boys at the White House were known as members of the White House Gang, <laughs> so named by the members of the Washington, D.C. Police Force and the Secret Service who were so often the targets of their shenanigans and their spitballs. <laughs> One story illustrative from the White House. It was the middle of winter. I left the White House for an appointment. I ascended an open-air carriage. As I did so, one Washington, D.C. police officer gave me a crisp salute. And when the tips of his fingers hit the brim of his helmet, so did a giant 30-pound snowball drop from the White House roof. The snowball smashed through the officer's helmet and left him knocked out cold on the driveway. I did not need to investigate. I turned over my shoulder. I said, boys, get down here immediately. Down the boys came. They apologized. They meant to frighten us for fun, not to harm anyone. I looked into the issue and I discovered that officer was long overdue for, an, uh, uh, for an, uh, uh, a promotion. <laughs> I did not uh, purposefully mean to skip over the boys uh, Archie or Kermit, but uh, 
Archie served in World War I, and he was here at home when I was convalescing from my illness and surgery towards the end of my life. Archie was declared 100% disabled from his wounds in France. It wouldn't keep the boy from volunteering again in World War II. He fought in the Solomon Islands. Major Archibald Roosevelt, he was injured again in the same lower extremities. To our knowledge, Major Archibald Roosevelt, Archie in the family, is the only soldier to have been declared 100% disabled by his wounds in both World War I and World War II. Archie was a member of those uh, White House gang boys. Uh, one evening we had a sleepover at the White House. Every parent and grandparent knows a sleepover is a good time to post extra guards. I drank a gallon and a half of coffee each and every day. I was normally the last guard awake at the White House. Uh, this particular evening, uh, I was walking the hallways and reading, as I often did. I was reading Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Somewhat appropriate material, given the boys sleeping over. Uh, and I was on guard for some sort of Tom or Huck-like mischief. There was something afoot. I, I just could not put my finger upon it. But then I realized, as you know, the White House is a wonderful museum. A treasure trove of portraits of presidents and first ladies adorn the walls. And there is something truly hideous when spitballs have all been placed for their eyes. <laughs> I woke the culprits and they spent the wee hours of the morning cleaning off those portraits. And in the words of diplomacy, the Taft and Garfield children were persona non grata in the White House for some time thereafter. They could not come and play. It was Archie that was here, January 6th, 1919. The date of my demise, Epiphany Day on the Christian calendar. And it was he who cabled to France to his brothers, the old lion is dead. I lived a wonderful life here at Sagamore Hill. I would not have changed my life for anything in the world. I had no regrets whatsoever. That my family and my boys and my daughters served should not be a surprise. Kermit served in World War I and in World War II, joining the British forces to get into each of the wars early. But if I may be frank, Kermit suffered from what many a modern soldier or sailor or airman suffers from. Depression, alcohol, do you say post-traumatic stress syndrome? Relieved of his duties in the British forces uh, through the offices of his wife, Cousin Franklin appointed Kermit to be a major in the United States Army and was sent to Alaska where he trained the Alaskan militia during World War II. In December of 1943, Kermit took his own life with his service revolver. Each and every day, there are veterans of our armed forces and active duty members of our armed forces that lacking hope, finding themselves in despair, suffering from trauma. Those men and those women are taking their own lives. And that is a tragedy. The highest office in the land is not president. The highest office in this country is citizen. And in the spirit of the Roosevelt children who lived and served as citizens and soldiers, I ask each and every one of you here today to recommit yourself to the duties of citizenship. That you carry your fair share of the load. Yes, to pull your own weight and to provide for your family. But then afterwards, live not the life of ignoble ease. Live the strenuous life on behalf of those in your community who serve and who have served and who have made great sacrifice. That you and yours might live free and prosperous. Do your duty and ask your local American Legion, VFW, Veterans Hospital, or USO what you can do to assist the men and women of our armed forces, their families, their widows, and their orphans. Now you may say, as one senator said coming to the White House, Mr. President, you're preaching. I said, Senator, you're right. And the presidency is a bully pulpit, too. I hope it is a bully pulpit that I used in some way that you might still appreciate today. I thought the greatest accomplishment of the Roosevelt administration, the digging of a little ditch down in Central America. 
Who has gone through the Panama Canal? You've seen a great wonder of American engineering and labor and medicine. Dr. William Crawford Gorgas eliminating yellow fever and malaria from the canal zone. When completed, the canal cut to one third the amount of time necessary to move our great naval assets from one ocean to the other. Not unrelated and a fitting capstone to my administration, when the great white fleet, 16 battleships, painted white the color of peace, referred to return to Norfolk and to Hampton Roads on Washington's birthday, February 22nd, 1909, that great fleet had accomplished what no Spanish, Dutch, or English armada had ever accomplished before, and demonstrated successfully to the powers of Asia and the powers of Europe that the United States Navy could do in peacetime what might be necessary to do in wartime. Domestically, I'm remembered for 230 million acres of national parks, national forests, wildlife refuges, bird sanctuaries, and national monuments <laughs> declared or legislated during my administration. It was not easy to give the American people more national parks. It takes an act of Congress to name a national park. On this issue of the conservation of our natural resources, I was a progressive. And I discovered that very often the opposite of progress is Congress. <laughs> it was my own fellow Republican, Speaker of the House Joe Cannon of Danville, Illinois, who had famously said, not one cent for scenery. You good people know that the national parks are not just scenery. They are the nation's playgrounds and wild places, organized on the most democratic of principles, that they belong to each of us, hence to all of us, and hence to each and to all the responsibility to pass these parks and historic sites onto future generations in better condition than we found them, and not in worse. I congratulate Secretary of the Interior Zinke, the first cabinet member from Montana, and to all of those who serve the National Park Service and their sister agencies in the Department of the Interior. They put themselves at risk each and every day, not just the rangers who are law enforcement, but those who rescue the traveler in the woods. They give advice and counsel to the tourists, but at any moment they might be fighting a fire or face to face with some dangerous criminal who seeks refuge in our wild places. Keep the men and women of the National Park Service and the Inter Department of the Interior in your constant and fervent prayers. Finally, I ask each and every one of you to rededicate yourselves to find some good deed or good task in your community, uh, the end of which you'll pursue with dogged determination. There's got to be some cause in your hometown, some people that need assistance, some life that can be made better for your actions. You're doing good deeds, I know, for historic preservation, for the conservation of our natural resources, for causes like conservation, education, preservation. You're doing good deeds at your temples, your synagogues, your churches. Well, this is America. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Certainly no good deed goes without its second guessing, its Monday morning quarterbacking, its criticism. Persist in your good deeds. The Republic needs them now more than ever. And when you are criticized, take heart from the words that I shared with the French a century ago at the Sorbonne, the University of Paris. The speech is called Citizenship in a Republic. And Ranger Furman is greatly delighted to know I shall not recite the speech in its entirety. <laughs> it is a small portion of that speech which remains famous to this day. It delights me to know today that these words are stenciled below decks on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. The Navy calls that great nuclear aircraft carrier the big stick, as in the old African proverb I was wont to quote, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. Well, good citizens, persist in your good deeds, and when you are criticized, take heart and remember, it is not the critic who counts. 
Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man and today to the woman who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again. Because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who knows the great devotions, the great enthusiasms, who spends herself in a worthy cause, and who in the end, at the best, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, that his name shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Good citizens, we've all known victory, we've all known defeat. We're all human. We all prefer the former over the latter. But I travel the country sharing stories of life here at Sagamore Hill and my life as a young boy nearby Gramercy Park and my life in the arena to give encouragement. When I was a little boy, some of the youngsters know I had asthma. So bad that I nearly died of asthma. But my father told me to build my body, and I, I did so through calisthenics and lifting weights, rowing and swimming. I built my body. I seem to have overdone it just a bit. <laughs> As a young man, I suffered terrible tragedy. You've heard the stories. My father dying when I was a sophomore at college. I went to the north woods of Maine to heal and to be outdoors. When I was a young man, a young member of the New York General Assembly, but 25 years old, I lost my wife and mother on the same day of two different diseases. My widowed mother of typhoid fever, my wife, but 22 years old, and a new mother, Bright's disease, a kidney disease now quite treatable by modern medicine. And I got action and went west to the badlands of Dakota Territory, where horse riding and ranching and hunting, I healed. I got back in the family way, married Mrs. Edith Carroll Roosevelt. We reared those children here. At the White House, Mrs. Roosevelt and I reared six children. Mrs. Roosevelt claimed she reared seven children there. <laughs> we had 17 grandchildren. Why, what if I had given up on such a family life after such that terrible tragedy, that fa Valentine's Day? Why, even in politics, uh, the public servants here know as a young man, I ran for the mayorship of New York. I came in third out of three. <laughs> That's last place. What if I had given up after such a humiliating defeat in my home city? I would have never been your president fighting for the square deal. The reason, by the way, that the artist got some borglum says, I'm atop Mount Rushmore with the other three. No, indeed, even the youngest amongst us knows that into each and every one of our lives, there will be hardship and tragedy and defeat. Life will knock you down. Your duty to yourself when it does so is to get back up, dust yourself off, and get back into the fight for life. Because there are future generations of Americans depending upon each and every one of you to answer the call of citizenship and to do your duty and to never, ever forget those who serve beneath that flag. I must admit in conclusion that uh, perhaps outside of Sagamore Hill today and across the country, perhaps I'm not remembered as well as I might like to be. Uh, I'm just so much dust in the streets of history. Uh, I'm probably no longer remembered for the, the Nobel Peace Prize for settling the Russo-Japanese War or the, the Medal of Honor for charging up San Juan Hill with the Rough Riders. Perhaps I must acknowledge I'm best remembered not for the legacy of success and achievement, but for the legacy of a failure. A failed bear hunt in Onward, Mississippi in 1902, when I refused to shoot a bear that had been wounded and tied to a tree. The Mictum family of Brooklyn, a candy store and toy manufacturers, hearing that story and seeing uh, uh, Clifford Berryman's cartoon of the incident, uh, they wrote me a letter at the White House asking permission to make a stuffed bear and to name it after me. I wrote back, I said, you may go ahead and do so, but I don't think it will help your sales very much at all. I wonder if any of you have known the love and comfort of what then was known as Teddy's Bear, with the apostrophe possessive S. Do any of you still have your teddy bear? Oh, up with your hands, men. Real men have teddy bears. I see some of you ladies have married your teddy bears. That's the way that works. 
Well, the toy manufacturers, enthused by the unexpected profits that came from the sale of Teddy's Bear, they thought they would equally profit if they made a stuffed animal in honor of each and every subsequent resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House. But I'm afraid in honor of William Howard Taft and for the toy manufacturers, America's mothers never really took kindly to putting Billy the Possum in with the children at night. <laughs> the teddy bear reigned supreme. And uh, before I uh, leave the stage, I'm going to find uh, at least uh, one young man that I think I saw on his father's belly. And this nice young lady here who's held my hat, I think we should exchange. This is a National Park Service Centennial Teddy Bear. And uh, I hope that you'll have fun with this teddy bear. You're welcome. There you are. And I'm going to find that little baby on his father's belly as well. And would you join me all in three cheers for the National Park Service, Sagamore Hill, and all that our Creator has given us most especially, life liberty and the pursuit of happiness that is remembered in our Declaration of Independence. Keep it alive by your duties and actions as good citizens of this country. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Happy Fourth of July!